Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Restore live stream. It's great to be with you again. Uh, if you are a regular uh, tuner in to the live stream, you'll know that at the moment we're working our way through the book of Exodus, and we're looking at our whole theme of uh, from sonship to freedom, which is the overarching theme of the book of Exodus. If you watched when I uh, did the intro on the first week, uh, one of the things that I, uh, one of the phrases that I used was, Exodus is not a story about a people who escape but about a God who rescues. And so we're looking at the power of God to rescue from the book of Exodus. Uh, we're uh, spending uh, eight weeks going through the book of Exodus, partly because the Bible is full of fantastic stories that help us understand the uh, nature of God, the greatness of God, and the power of God. And Exodus is one of those stories. I'm passionate about the Bible, and uh, I think I, I understand it's not always the easiest book for people to get into, but actually once you get used to it and you dig be, deep beneath the surface, it has has real power to change our lives. So I'm passionate as we journey through the book of Exodus that actually uh, as we go through each week that maybe we'll fall more and more in love with the uh, word of God. Now, there's one house group and uh, I'm on their WhatsApp chat uh, and they decided that they were going to take a chapter of Exodus each day and they would read through it as a group and then they would discuss it on the WhatsApp group. It's a very busy WhatsApp group and also someone on the group found um, a connection with the Bible Project. I, I don't know if you're aware of the Bible Project, they do some amazing work, they've got amazing videos uh, that are free on their uh, website and they've also got uh, in-depth teaching on the book of Exodus and so uh, most of the small group have been journeying through their in-depth teaching, they kind of have half hour uh, lectures that you can uh, watch or classroom conversations really about the key bits in the book of Exodus, all free on the Bible Project website, you can find it if you want to. It also means that that particular house group are going really deep, they're doing deep dives into the book of Exodus so whenever I speak now on the book of Exodus I'm really feeling the pressure because I I know some people have done their homework, so I kind of feel like we need to make sure that we give quality teaching, not that we don't ever on a Sunday morning, hey. But anyway, I'm waffling and talking about lots of other things when today I should be talking to you about the book of Exodus. And uh, today, uh, if you want a title for today really, I've called today The Road to Freedom. The Road to Freedom. And what we're going to look at today is we're going to cover uh, quite a big chunk of Exodus. We're going to cover from Exodus chapter 6 through to Exodus chapter 11. But it's, uh, it, today's uh, passages are all about the confrontation between Pharaoh and uh, Moses and, uh, and then uh, how that confrontation is worked out of 10 plagues that uh, uh, God uses to free Israel from their slavery in Egypt and to show Egypt who God really is. Again, uh, if uh, you watch the intro, you'll know that the key passage in Exodus really to explain the whole book is Exodus chapter 6. And uh, in Exodus chapter 6, two verses, Exodus 6, verse 6 to 7 says, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people and I will be your God and then you will know I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And in that passage, uh, one of the reasons it's key is there's four I wills. There's, uh, God speaks and he says, I will bring you out, I will free you, I will redeem you and I will take you as my people. And then he ends it with, then you will know I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the yoke of Egyptians. And, and from Exodus 7 through to uh, chapter 11, the phrase, then you will know that I am the God. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. Then you will know who I really am. Then you will know the fullness of my power. That phrase occurs seven times. And if you know anything about Hebrew, uh, then uh, uh, numbers uh, represent uh, different things in the Hebrew language. And the number seven represents completion. And so the use of the phrase seven times, then you will know that I am God, is it's like God is saying, through these plagues, you will see the fullness of who I am and it will change you. It will form something new in you as my people. Because remember, God is creating a new people from the nation of Israel. And it's when we see the bigness of God, we understand who he is 
but also who we are and uh, who he's made us to be as well. Because uh, we're made in the image of God, so we're the reflection of God. So when we centre ourselves on him, then we uh, have the ability to grow up into the fullness of everything that God intended for us to be. So in this bit of Exodus, we get the story of the the ten uh, plagues. And uh, if you want a list of them, um, just for completeness, um, we get the uh, water of the Nile turning to blood. We get the frogs, a plague of frogs in chapter eight. We then get a plague of gnats. Then we get a plague of flies. Then we get a pestilence on the livestock. Then we get a plague of boils. We get the plague of hail. We get a plague of locusts. And then we get darkness that covers the, the land for three days. And then we get the last plague, which is the death of the firstborns and the point of uh, Israel uh, having the first ever Passover. I'm um, going to look at the Passover and, uh, and the parting of the Red Sea next week. So today, as I say, we're going to focus on these uh, 10 plagues. Now, just a few things really that are worth considering about this. Number one, there's a number of theories around why did God use, use plagues and why did he use 10 plagues to uh, uh, release uh, Israel from slavery in Egypt. And there's a number of thoughts on it. Um, One of the traditional thoughts is that each of the plagues in some way represents a power of an Egyptian god being broken. And so um, the land of Egypt, they used to uh, worship a number of gods. And some people have tried to link what the gods represented to different one of of the plagues. And actually in chapter 12, Exodus 12, verse 12, uh, God says, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And so one school of thought is that uh, each plague represents the power of a different god and that God is uh, showing that he is more powerful than all of these false gods. And so it's kind of a dethroning of the gods of Egypt. Some other people have, uh, have wondered whether there's some kind of link between the different plagues and that whether there could be some sort of natural devastation that uh, creates um, the succession of plagues as we see them. So, for example, if there was uh, something, if there was a problem in the water of the Nile and some sort of disease or some sort of disruption that meant uh, uh, the kind of the brown dirt from the bottom was washed up to the top, then it could appear that the Nile was, uh, was, was like a river of blood. And when that happened, you maybe would expect that the frogs would leave the Nile and come up on the dry land. And then when the flog- frogs died, um, as their bodies start to decay and things, you're likely to get uh, flies and pestilence and that kind of thing. And out of that, potentially, disease that could uh, attack the livestock and those sort of things. So some people have tried to track it and say, maybe this was kind of a a natural manifestation. Um, Not saying that God wasn't behind it, but maybe the way that it happened successively was because it was a natural manifestation. It's quite an interesting theory, um, that one. Uh, Where I think it has a weakness is when you get towards the end and you get the plague of of hail and uh, darkness and then the killing of the firstborn. That kind of doesn't feel like it, 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 it flows Uh, with the rest of it. And also, when you look at the text of it, uh, before each plague, Moses confronts Pharaoh and says, this is going to happen. And he says, quite often says, this is going to happen tomorrow. And and also, when the plague happens and Pharaoh pleads for relief, then uh, Moses goes and he he ends the plague right there. So so it kind of feels like the stops and starts is more than you would get with a natural flow. But it is interesting. and, And I think quite often, Um, in the natural everyday or in the science of the world, we also see the hand of God. So I don't think the two things necessarily um, conflict. Um, The the latest kind of theory that that I think in many ways has a lot of credibility, if you watch the uh, intro uh, video, you'll know that we uh, drew out a lot of links between Exodus and the book of Genesis, the book that goes before it. And Genesis is, is a book of creation and the beginning of all things. In many ways, one interpretation you can put on the, fl- on the plagues is to see them as acts of decreation. So when we see the beginning of Genesis, it says that uh, before God started the process of creating, it says the, the earth was in chaos and confusion, literally. So the earth was a mess, and then God begins the process of creation, and he speaks. And interestingly enough, God speaks ten times in the process of creation. 
and uh, in the process of decreation through the pla plagues, God acts ten times. So it seems to be like an echo or, uh, or a connection back to Genesis. And also in the creation uh, story, uh, then the way that God creates is he separates and he brings structure and order. So he separates day from night. He separates the water above from the waters below. He separates the dry land from the water. And then he fills each of those things on the next three days of creation. So he puts the sun, moon, stars in place. Uh, he fills the uh, air with uh, birds and the seas with fishes. Um, and then he uh, puts ve vegetation on the land and then he forms man. And when you look through the plagues and their consequences, you find that, th that there's an undoing of all of that. So we find livestock are killed. Uh, we find um, that the uh, uh, frogs come out the sea and go onto dry land. And, uh, and frogs are able to live in the sea and on dry land. So that separation between sea and land is kind of broken down uh, with that, uh, we find that we get darkness over the land where God started with let there be light. Uh, the series of plagues ends with darkness. And so, it, so it's like uh, there is a reverse in Pharaoh's rebellion and hard heartedness. In Pharaoh's standing against God, the consequence of that is a destruction of his nation. And the reversing of the Genesis process is part of that destruction of the nation. Again, uh, we see with the uh, um, the, uh, at the beginning of the Genesis story, it says the Holy Spirit is hovering over the water. And the first act of decreation we get through the ten plagues is the waters of the Nile shift. And the waters of the Nile turning to blood. It's interesting to remember that uh, at the start of Exodus, we find Pharaoh drowning the Israelite kids in the Nile. And uh, as the judgment then that God brings on the nation of Egypt, there's blood in the Nile. And ultimately, it's going to be the children of, uh, 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 of the land of Egypt. It's going to be the firstborn that are going to be uh, killed. And so like God is, is, in many ways, Pharaoh is reaping what he's sown. And God is bringing this ex uh, the, the um, execution of judgment um, on Egypt. So in many ways, what we see through the plagues there is a d destruction happening. And the reality is, if we don't live God's way in God's world, we can't expect God to bless us. And if the world was made uh, and designed to operate in a certain way, which I believe it was, if we don't cooperate with that, we will get chaos and confusion. It's a bit like me. I'm if I uh, buy a new piece of furniture from somewhere like Ikea or something like that, you get your instruction manual and, uh, and, and you try and follow it to put the piece of furniture together. And hopefully, if the manual is good and your ability is good, you can end up with a, with a complete bit of furniture at the end of it. But if you don't follow the uh, manual, if you make it up trying to do it your own way, quite often you end up with several bits out of place and the whole thing doesn't hold together the way it was meant to. And I think the same is true of life, that if we don't piece uh, life together according to the manufacturer's instructions, we will end up with something that's less than we would have had otherwise. Equally, if, if we intentionally go against or ignore or rebel against the manufacturer's instructions, we will definitely end up in a mess. And it feels like in the midst of this, and remember, uh, Pharaoh and Egypt had been oppressing God's people. They'd been ruthlessly brutal in oppressing them and killing their kids. They'd been uh, putting them under forced labor. And in the end, God says, enough is enough. And I'm going to show you the consequences of your actions. I'm going to show you the chaos that this is creating. And I'm going to bring back on you everything you've been trying to put on the Israelites. And it feels like it's the journey that God had to take them through to get Pharaoh ultimately to a place that he would finally say, OK, I'm going to now let these people go. Um, a number of things just to draw out from the passage that I think are interesting and uh, worth uh, noting. Uh, number one, um, there's ten plagues, but they come in three patterns of three. And then there's the final Passover and the death of the firstborn. So you get three threes and then the tenth one. Now, there's a rhythm that happens in the three threes. And uh, in that, there's a warning that happens for the first plague. There's a warning that happens for the second one. And there's no warning for the third one. 
and then the fourth one there's a warning, the fifth one there's a warning, the sixth one there's no warning, and you get the same pattern in the seventh there's a warning, in the eighth there's a warning, in the ninth there's no warning. And so it seems like written in the language there's a rhythm. Um, the second thing that's interesting to note is that with the first couple of plagues, uh, Pharaoh gets together his magicians or his, uh, his, uh, his leaders of, uh, of worship of other gods. And he, he says, this is what Moses has done. This is what God has done. Can you replicate that? And in the first two plagues, we find that the magicians manage to replicate it. Now notice, if you're besieged by a plague, actually what you want is someone to take away what is besieging you. <laughs> Uh, and rather than take away what is besieging them, the, the magicians come and they multiply it. So actually it doesn't make it any better, it makes it worse. But what's significant is in the third plague, uh, which is the plague of the gnats, uh, uh, which then leads on to the plague of the flies, the magicians are unable to replicate the power of the plague. And so they get to a point where in uh, chapter 8, verse 19, the magicians say to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. This is the finger of God. So in other words, they have never seen a power like they see loosed by Yahweh at the hands of Moses. It's a bit like uh, when people looked at Jesus in the New Testament and they said, we've never seen anyone like this in the history of Israel. And again, God is showing the fullness of who he is. And any other God, any other power that is worshipped has no power compared to the power of God. Yes, there is a power in other uh, demonic forces. Yes, there can be power in other things. The magicians did have some real power, but it was nothing compared to the power of the living God. And remember, 10 plagues, they could only replicate two of them. So how much more powerful is Yahweh than any of the other gods that were um, uh, being worshipped at that time in, in Egypt? Another thing interesting to note is from the fourth plague onwards, God makes a distinction between the Israelites and the Egyptians. So the whole land comes under the first few plagues, but then when it gets to uh, plague number four, which is the plague of the, of the flies, God says, on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, which is where Israel was. And uh, the name Goshen actually means place of comfort. <laughs> so on that day, I will make a place of comfort for my people where my people are living so that no swarm of insects will be there in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land and I will put a division between my people and your people. And we see the beginnings of God creating a new separate nation with the nation of Israel. And we see God's protection over Israel whilst the enemy is, uh, is, uh, is creating havoc over Egypt. And it's a lovely picture of, again, thinking about our overarching theme in Exodus, that we have a God that rescues us. And uh, it, it, God is now putting his arms around Israel and protecting them from what is assaulting the land. One of the things we can be confident in, many, many pr promises through the Bible on it, is that in times of hardship, God will stand alongside us and God will carry uh, us through it. That's why Psalm 23 is such a famous uh, psalm and such a favourite psalm of so many people. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And there's a promise, even when I journey through the valley of the shadow of death, you will be there, your rod and your staff, they will comfort me. And just that sense that God is a, is a God of comfort and he's willing to comfort us through it. Another interesting thing is, is we get in the confrontation between Moses and Pharaoh after a little while, and it is incredible how uh, Pharaoh is so stubborn and so proud and so long refuses to give way. After a little while, he starts to offer Moses compromises. So Moses says um, to Pharaoh, can you let my people go because they need to go three days into the wilderness and worship God. And Pharaoh, to begin with, says absolutely no. And then he ends up saying, well, you can worship your God, but you can't leave the land. And then he says, you can worship your God, but you can't go very far. And then he says, you will worship your God, but you can't take your wives and your children. And then he says, you can worship your God and go, but you can't take your livestock. In other words, he's trying to uh, force them to leave something behind as a guarantee that they will come back. And what Moses does is he withstands um, that pressure from Pharaoh and refuses to compromise. 
And I was just struck when I was reading through it, and a question I started to ask myself is, when God speaks, am I sometimes tempted to compromise because it feels like it will make life simpler? And Moses knew that there was a whole new work that God wanted to do. There was a whole new people he wanted to create. And if that was going to be created on the right foundation, he needed to have a, a commitment, a ruthless commitment, to obey God wholeheartedly. Not just to be half-hearted, but wholeheartedly. Which meant that he needed to push through and resist any compromise. And just throw it out as a question for you this morning. Is there an area of your life and actually, if you invited the gaze of God into it, would he be happy with how you're living? And is there an area in your life when you know really what you ought to do, and yet the temptation to compromise, to, to go part the way in your obedience, has been something that you've given place to? And uh, my experience is you never do get into the fullness that God has for you if you settle halfway, it's a bit like uh, in the Old Testament, uh, a little bit later on in the journey to the Promised Land. But there's two and a half tribes and they get in sight of the Promised Land and they see the Jordan River and they, the, the ground looks good. And uh, because it's next to a river, it looks fruitful. And they say, do you know what? I don't know whether we really need to go all the way into the Promised Land. We could just settle here, couldn't we? And Moses is, is really strong with what he says to them. It's actually where the phrase in the Bible, uh, be sure your sin will find you out, comes from. And he says to them, be sure your sin will find you out if you settle here and discourage your brothers from going the whole journey. In the end, they do decide to settle there, but they say to Moses, we will cross over to the promised land with everyone. We will fight until the whole of the promised land is taken, and then we'll come back because we do not want to sow compromise into the hearts of God's people. So I think one of the things that comes out of this is we need to have a, a ruthless determination to be radical in our wholehearted obedience to what God is speaking to us. And that's actually what ultimately separates us as God's people, isn't it? Um, the other thing that I just think is worth uh, pointing out is, uh, if you remember last week, I don't know how much of it um, was talked about on the live stream actually, but when God first spoke to Moses, uh, Moses was reluctant to go and uh, confront Pharaoh, not only because Pharaoh was, was mighty and powerful, but because Moses felt unworthy, he felt unable, felt unqualified for the role. And uh, one of the things he came up with was, was I'm not a gifted speaker. Um, I can't communicate well. And, uh, and so God said, well, take your brother with you, take Aaron, because Aaron is a good spokesman. And so you hear what I'm talking, uh, what I'm saying, you then speak it to Aaron, Aaron can confront Pharaoh with it. Um, when we see through the, uh, when we work through the pattern of the 10 tribes, we see that the first three plagues, uh, God speaks to Moses, Moses speaks to Aaron, Aaron confronts Pharaoh. But after the first three plagues, Moses is the one who stands against Pharaoh. Moses is the one who speaks out. So Aaron takes the lead in confronting Pharaoh three times. Moses does it the next seven times. And as Moses stands, as Moses begins the journey of stepping into who God has called him to be, Moses increasingly gets released into the man that he was destined to be. And I think there's a wonderful lesson in that as well. As we take the first step on our journey, even if, even if, if God spoke spoken to us uh, something and we feel fearful and we feel timid and we feel afraid. If we take one step, God will meet with us. If we take another step, God will meet us, with us. If we take another step, God will meet with us. And eventually we'll come to a point of breakthrough when we will become everything that, uh, that God has wanted us to become. And we will break through beyond some of the insecurities and the things that might hold us back. And we see that in this story. Uh, there's one other thing I want to talk about this morning, and then I'll bring us into land. And it's really the issue that some people uh, find difficult in this whole uh, section. And it has to do with the state of Pharaoh's heart. Because in chapter 3, verse 19, when uh, God is speaking to Moses and kind of setting up the intro to this confrontation with Pharaoh and uh, the battle that will have to happen to get Israel into freedom... Um, God says this about uh, Pharaoh. He says, but I know the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. 
And then in chapter 7, verse 3, he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. And a number of times through this passage, it talks about Pharaoh's heart being hardened. And uh, a number of the later references to it um, seem to talk about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And it opens up that whole question of how much free choice do I have? How much free will do I have? And how much does God orchestrate or force things? And actually, we see in this passage the whole destruction of a nation. And did God force that? And was that fair? And sometimes in life, when things happen to us, we ask that question, don't we? Sometimes we say, this isn't fair. Sometimes we say it to other people. Sometimes we say it to God, this isn't fair. And sometimes we ask the question, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? And is that okay? And, and can we trust the character of God? Or sometimes, are some of the bad things that happen, is that God uh, forcing us to go through that pain? Um, and it is a big question. The theologians have debated it for years and years and years. When we work through this passage, though, um, I think um, we can unpack it in a way that helps us see that God is good and that God never overrides our free will. Because when we work through this, this passage, we find a number of times, as I say, it talks about the hardening of God's heart. But actually, when you look through the first five plagues, Every time when it talks about Pharaoh's heart growing hard, every time it's either Pharaoh who's hardening his heart or it says his heart grew hard. And none of the first five plagues does it anywhere say God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So it seems like Pharaoh is, is making a resolve, is making a commitment, is making a choice not to yield to God. And then it's, he gets the consequences of his actions. And uh, you know, any, anybody who's parented will know one of the ways that you have to parent sometimes is to let your kids take the consequences of their actions because that's the way they learn. And so Pharaoh is setting himself up in rebellion, in opposition to God. And then with each of the plagues, he's reaping the consequences of his choices. Now, from, from the sixth plague onwards, there's a number of references that say God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But actually, in Hebrew, um, the word that is used for hardened heart, whenever we talk about hardening hearts, and for me, certainly, I think about, uh, about like a covering, like a casing, uh, like, a, like, a, like a toughness uh, being put on my heart. Actually, in Hebrew, um, they used to talk less about that. And when they talked about a hardened heart, they would mean like a strong heart. They would mean a courageous heart. They would mean a heart that has the strength to push through. And so the second five plagues, when it talks about God hardens Pharaoh's heart, actually it probably is more the sense of God gave Pharaoh the strength in his heart to follow through with his actions. So it's not like God forced Pharaoh not to repent. And actually at numerous points in it, he half does repent and offers a compromise. But it's not like God is forcing Pharaoh and saying, you can't turn back now, you can't turn back now, you can't turn back now. But God is saying to Pharaoh, OK, if you're still choosing to be against me, I'm going to give you the strength to really stand against me. So God is just letting him, again, take the consequences of his actions. And there's no change in the state of Pharaoh's heart. God is just strengthening him to push all the way through. And the end of it is he destroys the whole nation. There's absolute devastation. And we'll see next week his, his army ends up uh, being killed uh, in the waters of the... Uh, uh, of, of the Red Sea. Uh, the whole nation loses its vegetation, loses its crops, loses its, its uh, livestock. All the firstborns are killed. Total destruction of the nation, all because he stands against God's commands, God's instructions, God's leading. And the end result of that is always destruction and devastation. You might be watching this morning and maybe life isn't going the way you wanted it to. Maybe you've just randomly ended up tuning into this or you're watching it on YouTube. Do you know, if life isn't working the way that you intended it to, the best question to ask is, am I aligning my life with God's best for me? Am I aligning my life with God's will for me? And if we're not, then we need to repent. And the word repent simply means we need to change our mind or instruction to Pharaoh, maybe change our heart 
We need to make a decision that we're going to do something different. We need to make a decision. Uh, and that turning point is coming to a point where we say, God, I've suddenly realised I've been making a mess of my life. I've been trying to do it my way instead of do it your way. I, I've been uh, trying to live life how I thought was best instead of uh, yielding, surrendering to you. God, will you forgive me? God, will you wash me? God, will you cleanse me? But God, will you help me turn my heart around and I want to yield to you. And if Pharaoh had done that right at the very beginning, the end point for e Egypt would have been massively different. But he had a stubborn heart. And uh, it, 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 if you are watching this and you never surrendered your heart to God, I would suggest now is a really wise time to think about doing that. But also you might be watching this and uh, maybe in the past you've had a heart that has been fully surrendered to God. But maybe your heart has got hardened. Maybe things have happened that have caused you to withdraw. Maybe uh, life has been tough and uh, out of that toughness you've put a protection, you put a covering around your heart. Maybe you've been hurt, wounded, let down. If we don't deal with that damage to our hearts, our hearts will shrink and the protective casing will shut everyone out, God include it. And that's not a place that God wants us to live. I've been reading in my daily devotions recently about uh, David, King David in the Old Testament. And uh, it says when uh, Samuel uh, went to anoint David as the next king of Israel, it says, the Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. I don't know about you, I want to be a man after God's own heart. And I want to be a man who carries God's heart. A lot of the Psalms, a lot of the worship in the Old Testament was written by David. It was written by David because he was a worshipper of God and his heart was full of praise and adoration for God. I want to be a man like that. I want to be a man with a yielded, soft heart. I want to be a man whose heart is quick to obey God. I want to be a man whose heart is malleable, that God is able to form. I want to be able to feel the things that God feels. I want to be able to walk down the street and see people with the same compassion that Jesus had when he saw the crowds. I want to be able to see the individual in need who's crying out in a crowd who wants me to stop for him. I want to have eyes to see what's going on around. I want to have a heart to feel what's going on around. And that will come if I, as Proverbs chapter 4 says, guard my heart well. By which I mean if I deal with any bruising or hurting or offence and I continually bring that back to God and I ask for a healing and a restoration that keeps my heart subtle, supple, and surrendered, sorry, not subtle, supple and surrendered, so that I'm ready to receive what God is saying. I'm ready to obey. I'm the antithesis of what Pharaoh was. This morning, what's the state of your heart? Is it a good season to ask God just to be working to renew? There's a promise in uh, uh, Ezekiel that God will take out hearts of stone and renew them for a heart of flesh. Wouldn't it be great if in this season, the work of God's spirit, as we journey through the book of Exodus, restores our heart and takes away the hardness, the heart of stone, the bits of stone, and uh, brings again a wonderful heart of flesh, fully surrendered, beating in alignment to the heartbeat of heaven, because that's what God wants for us all. I'm gonna pray, and then we'll end our time together this morning. Lord, I guess what this story tells us more than anything else is the, the folly of standing against you. And Lord, we have no idea what the backstory was for Pharaoh, but it feels like he was so proud, maybe so fearful, that it led him to a point of folly that destroyed his nation. And... I guess not many of us this morning are rulers of nations, but maybe we have responsibility in families, in households, over our life, in communities. And we're in danger of causing chaos, 
and confusion if we don't align ourselves with you. And Lord, I pray, Lord, this morning, any way that we are out of line with you, we want to say sorry, we want to surrender, we want to repent, and we want to yield to you. Lord, will you forgive us? Will you wash us clean? Will you give us a new start? And Lord, I pray particularly over our hearts, Lord. We know that heart disease is a killer. And unprocessed things in our heart kills the life that you want to bring. And Lord, if I'm carrying hurt in my heart, if I'm carrying a hardness because I've not processed something or I've not forgiven someone, Lord, will you forgive me? I choose to surrender my heart once more to you. And Lord, will you take, Lord, the stony bits of my heart and restore them to how you want my heart to be? Lord, I want to be a man who's wholehearted for you. A man that you can say, there's Ian, there's a man after my, my own heart. And Lord, as I pray that over myself, I pray it over everyone watching today. And I pray, Lord, as we go away into the rest of our days, Lord, may we be sensitive to you and may we feel what you feel. May we see what you see. May we be truly willing to be the hands and the feet of Jesus into our families, into our communities, because we've aligned ourselves with the heartbeat of heaven. And I pray the power of your spirit to fill us and to lead us and to enable us to walk in your pathway and lead other people to the goodness of God. In your name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us today. I hope you've enjoyed it and found it helpful and informative. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless you.